Hey, I'm Stu Paul, and this is a writer's guide to shooting a documentary. This is going to be me taking you through what I learned while shooting my own documentary. The thing is, when you are making your own movie, you do have to be your own boss, and that means you're the one making the decisions. You need to look at yourself not just as an artist, but as a manager of your own time. You have a certain rhythm to your life as a writer, and that's going to go away. It's the same with a narrative film, but especially if you are a one-man or a one-woman show, uh, and you're shooting this, and you're running sound, and you're producing, that means that every night you are charging your batteries, you are offloading footage from your SD card, you are formatting your cards. Your life will be thrown into a certain amount of chaos. So the first point I want to make is that your skills as a writer are your most valuable asset. It's your ability to observe the world around you, to imagine, uh, and the tools you have with structure, your understanding of character and conflict, these are the things that not only make a good screenplay, they are also crucial to making a good documentary. I saw the story of Project Us unfolding in front of my eyes. Uh, I go to the yoga studio where one of the documentary subjects runs her movement therapy classes. And so I saw when there was a drunk driver that crashed into her building. I saw them rebuilding and her struggles trying to put her, her world back together. And I was there the morning that she found this piece of street art on her building and fell in love with it. And heard as she struggled to get in touch with the artist. And heard the story when they finally met and connected and had this amazing uh, creative collaboration that led to their idea to make street art together. And so that triggered the writer in me. Uh, I saw the scene in front of me, uh, you know, of this 70 year old woman and this 20 year old artist going out into the streets of Los Angeles together. And you know, that image that contains the story was what drove me to say, Hey, I think there's a story here. I think there's a documentary. Can I shoot it? They didn't know how they were going to meld their art forms, her movement and his street art, to, to make something new. And I knew that that process was going to be a large part of the structure. And so I basically, after our first meeting, went home and I mapped out the three-act structure. I knew that we would have the status quo of each of their worlds, the inciting incident, uh, the act one of them coming together, and their goal being, how do we combine our art forms to make street art? In addition, I knew that Inksap was going to be going back to Vietnam for the first time since he was 10 years old. That's something that we didn't know what was going to happen there, but I expected that whatever it was would be probably a turning point for the story. So when he went to Vietnam, uh, I had him shoot footage so that whatever inspired him on that journey could become part of the documentary when he came back. The end of Act 2 I always expected to be the, the kind of final night before they go out into the streets and the climax of the movie being them putting up their art for the first time together and you know seeing this journey fulfilled. Uh, it turned out though that was only the middle of the movie. The story kept going. Generally speaking, you know, for writing a screenplay, you know where it's going to end. Uh, sometimes the, the characters and the story surprises you, but with a documentary, you hope that the documentary then takes on its own life and the story begins going to new places, and that you are just trying to catch up. When the movie took on a life of its own, that's when things got interesting. Uh, Linda and Inksap's story, it began to spread out from the streets. Uh, they garnered the attention of the LA Times. Uh, there is a big mural that they are in talks to put up. They've even been accepted to this exhibition in Budapest. Inksap's parents were unaware that he was a street artist, uh, and so a lot of what he does in his art is tell his family's story because they are refugees from Vietnam and yet he sort of has this separation from his culture that he's working through in his art and him coming out to his family as his true authentic self became part of the movie. So there are discoveries that happen along the way and as it gets bigger you see new conflicts and again that's where your writer brain uh, kicks in. When you're writing, you always want your characters to be authentic. You don't want the hand of the writer telling them what to do. You want the truth of their voices and their actions to just 
flow through you and for them to tell you what happens. Um, the same thing happens with a documentary. Sometimes you need to reshoot things or you want things shot a certain way um, and that's fine and it's part of the process. Um, but your key should always be to try and capture something authentic. Authenticity is why we watch documentaries. It's what we're looking for. There's times when it seems like there's nothing happening and you want to turn off the camera and sometimes that's fine. Uh, if you need to you know, save your SD card, if you're saving battery life. But a lot of times the most authentic moments aren't the ones that you're planning for. They just happen. Like when Linda and Inksap were driving around uh, looking for places to put up their street art and they were driving past the Beverly Center and Linda looks out the window and she says, there used to be a kiddie park there. You could, you could ride ponies there. And uh, that was just, to me, that was just a beautiful, authentic moment uh, that came from this woman who has been alive for so many years, who has seen the city change and uh, is relaying that part of her story to Inksap and to the audience. One of the most crucial parts of directing a documentary is working with your documentary subjects. Uh, communication is the absolute key, as are boundaries. Uh, you need to be clear about what those boundaries are with your subjects, what they're comfortable with, what they're not. Um, you may not know at first, but you will find out. It's important to know when to turn off the camera and when to fight to leave it on. Uh, sometimes your documentary subjects will ask you to turn off the camera. And most of the time, that's the right thing to do. You should respect their wishes and do so. Sometimes you may want to say, are you sure that's necessary? Are you okay with me actually continuing to film this? I think it's important. Um, because sometimes their instinct will be to avoid showing conflict on film. And if it's conflict that doesn't need to be there for the movie, that isn't important, that shouldn't be filmed, then, then respect that. But if it is part of the story, and it's part of what is changing in their world, then you should voice that and let them know, I think this is important, I think it's worth filming. I'm going to get into a few technical tips I picked up along the way. First off, if you're shooting something, you know, know your lenses, understand photography. I highly recommend taking a photography class, and even if there's something that doesn't seem like it would be applicable, like outdoor portraits or fashion lighting, you will definitely learn something that will be useful. As long as you can read your histogram, know your ISO, you know, know your f-stops, how fast your lens is, you'll be in good shape. Hold your shot. When I went back and looked at the footage from the first thing uh, that I shot on the dock, I was astounded at just how often I was just moving the camera around. Once you find your composition, stick with it. Go there, count to 10 in your head, and let the action play. Another thing to keep in mind is practicality. Uh, you want to be able to keep your rig light and mobile um, and have only what you need. Uh, at the beginning of the shoot, like, I was rigged out with like, I had my Shogun recorder, I had my Zoom recorder, I had my shotgun mic, I had my LED light, and I could barely hold this thing steady. It's not going to be good footage if you're shooting 10 bit, but the footage is shaking all over the place. Uh, strip it down to the bare essentials and just get what you need. I like to run sound through an XLR adapter on top of my camera. That way I can get sound from a shotgun mic and a body mic, a lav. Uh, that way I have two options for sound. When Linda and Inksap were out on the streets, I would have them both mic'd up. And so I would run their labs to a zoom recorder that I just kept recording at all times and put in a, in a pouch uh, around my waist. And then I had my camera running with a boom on top for camera sound, and then you can sync them up later in post. So many cameras today are so powerful and capable of getting good footage. Unless your shoot has a specific need to upgrade, uh, I would start with the camera that you have. Especially when you know something is coming up that is important or that feels like it's out of your comfort zone, 
it's important to find someone to help you. Um, and you may have a bigger network than you know. For instance, there were a number of shoot days where something big was going down and I knew I needed a real DP to help me. One was the first time that Linda and Inksap met to collaborate on movement and sketching to, to figure out the designs for the art. I knew I wanted to shoot it on a gimbal so that it would be super smooth and sort of reflect the um, fluidity of Linda's movement and her world, but I wasn't comfortable using the gimbal. So I called my friend Pavel, who shot The Lord of Catan, my last movie, and he shot Hereditary last year. He's an amazing cinematographer, and I gave him the gimbal and knew that in his hands the thing would sing. And all I had to worry about was following along and try, trying not to get the boom in the shot. Other friends also pitched in. My friend John uh, ran B-cam for me a number of times. And you may feel weird reaching out to people, your friends and colleagues, asking them to help for little or no money. Um, but if you're passionate about your project and you can express that passion to them, they will want to help you. Think 10 steps ahead to the edit when you are shooting and you are just trying to get focus and composition and good sound, uh, but it's important to remember to get your coverage, to get your wide shots, to get your close-ups, and to stay focused on whatever the core of the scene is. Uh, in the end, you are going to need all those pieces to make the final film. There were times where I was shooting Inksap in his studio uh, and I was focused on his process, so a lot of the shots were just of close-ups and inserts on the art. But during this, he was also talking to me. And so it's good that I got his audio and I could put B-roll over it, but it would have been better if I spent a little more time on his face so that I could get that personal connection to the things he was saying. You are going to be dealing with way more footage than you have dealt with before, even if you shot a narrative film. Uh, and so organizing your footage is super important. Um, I had a friend run down for me his procedure, and it's worked pretty well for me. Uh, when you import your footage, just go in, and change the file names, and rename them with a prefix, uh, like A01 for that day's import, A02 for the next day's import, B01 for Bcam, etc. If you want to get really fancy, add in the date. Um, but that will give you unique file names and will keep things really organized and uh, you will make your editor very happy later. Your editor. Aren't you saying, oh, well, I was going to edit this myself. I thought maybe that's what I was going to do. Uh, and then I sat down and I looked at this 75 hours of footage I had and I was like, no, uh, I need someone who has done this before, who has this kind of brain, who has a fresh set of eyes uh, to help me tackle this. Marketing is one of the hardest things. At some point you're going to need to raise money. Um, for us, we're running a Kickstarter. Um, and timing is crucially important. Your network is important, planning is important, communicating with all the other people uh, on your team who are going to be helping you spread the word is big. There's social media, that hellscape. When we were planning to launch the Kickstarter, I knew that we were going to have this LA Times article coming. And for me, I thought, okay, we will launch our Kickstarter at such a time that the LA Times article drops in the middle of the campaign and we'll get a big surge and that's how we're going to make our goal. And then the LA Times article dropped earlier than I expected. I had set in my mind this narrative, this sequence of events. And then when the LA Times article dropped early, that changed. And my adaptation was, okay, let's launch faster. Let's use that momentum. Uh, let's just keep going. Essentially, it was the same plan. Uh, whereas perhaps what I should have done is say, let's step back, let's reassess the new playing field. But here I am, beating the drum, you know, doing everything I can to get the word out to tell people about this story, and that's why um, 
I'm here on Film Courage telling you about what I've learned. Probably the biggest advice I have is just to trust your gut and trust your instincts. The only times that I feel like I really made a mistake were when I didn't follow my gut feeling. Uh, so as writers, we get in our heads, we get lost, we overthink things. And so if you're feeling something, pay attention to that because your body is trying to tell you something. And when you're shooting a documentary, it's a more visceral experience than just sitting and writing. And so you need to be attuned to all of your senses and your instincts are a huge part of that. Remember to write. Just a little bit will go a long way. But if that's what you're best at in the world, it'll help you when you're doing things that you're less comfortable with. And it'll just keep you grounded. Other than that, I would say have fun. You are making it happen. You're taking a risk. You're picking up a camera. You're going out and making a movie. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know how it's going to turn out. And it's exciting. Uh, so that's something to be proud of because it takes, you know, it takes some cojones to go do that. So enjoy yourself.